Welcome to Inspire Me with Jay, a podcast focusing on meditation, the near-death experience, and all things spiritual. Hello, this is Jay Spillers with Inspire Me with Jay. My guest today is Rebecca George. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. So what exactly do you do? You're a therapist and you also work with um, Christian therapy specifically? Yeah, so I'm a mental health therapist and I'm also a Christian soul care coach. Um, and I am a public speaker, so I do a little bit of everything. Um, so yeah, I'm a mental health therapist, but I like to do um, coaching as well. So I don't know if you want me to go into what the difference is there, sure. um, but I do both coaching and, and therapy. You want me to talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So um, therapy is, is kind of the way that I see it. Therapy is... Um, is kind of going into the past a little bit more. So therapy is is digging a little bit more into past trauma. Therapy, you have to at least have a master's degree um, and be licensed as a mental health therapist. And so we, we dig a little bit more into um, clinical stuff, which is a little bit more of, um, I give a, a mental health diagnosis and we talk a lot more about trauma, about some of your past stuff, about what you've been through in the past. And we find out what your why why you're dealing with what you're dealing with, right? And so maybe um, you have like a lot more. Uh, maybe you come to me about what's going on with you with your your anxiety or your depression, um, and we talk about why you're you're dealing with that, right? Um, and it's more past related. Coaching is more about how do we get you to where you want to go. Coaching is more about um, you want to be somewhere different. So coaching is more like, how do we help you to get to from here to here, right? And so um, I take a lot of the tools that I learned as a therapist and help you to um, become uh, the person that you want to be. Um, so coaching is not therapy in that I don't give you a mental health diagnosis. We don't go into your past trauma. We're not going to talk as much about like maybe issues with family. We're not going to talk as much about trauma. Um, and it's really going to be a little bit more light hearted. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be more about your goals. Um, and I just tend to do that from a Christian perspective. So with your therapy work, do you blend faith with traditional therapy? I do. So I don't always. So um, I have a lot of clients that come to me that don't want to incorporate faith and they just want to do strictly clinical therapy. And that's totally fine with me. Um, if they, they prefer to do that, I like to do everything through the lens of the Bible because I am a Christian and that's a big, important part of my life. Um, but if somebody comes to me and says I'm an atheist or I'm not a Christian at all, or that's not, that's not something that I want to include, then I will do something, I will do therapy, specifically just clinical therapy. But I do prefer to do things as a mixture because we are um, spiritual beings and we are, you know, just more than just, um, you know, mental health, you know, people, right? We are more than just who we are here, right? And mm -hmm. so um, I believe that it has to be more than just one component of who we are. So how do you blend faith with therapy? Yeah, so I really just um, talk a lot about who we are as, as spiritual people. So I talk a lot about, um, you know, really diving into who God created us to be. And so, you know, if you are a believer, and I talk about who who God created us to be. So God didn't create us to barely survive. God didn't create us to be um, to be bound by depression and anxiety and crippled by these things, right? He created us to, to live an abundant life of freedom. Um, and so that's why he sent his son here to, to, to help us to um, be able to be free from those things. And so I really um, like to incorporate scripture and like to incorporate um, the, the things that, that the Bible talks about so that we can kind of see things through that lens. Because if we are Christians and we don't at least incorporate some of those things, um, I just think that we're missing a big piece, a big important piece of, of, of what we can do to help people. And it's almost like I'm carrying around this antidote that I, I feel like I can't give to people. Um, you know, a, a big piece of, of the peace that I get 
is, is my relationship with God. And if I'm not able to offer that to people, then I feel like I'm, I'm almost cheating people. So that's why I really like to incorporate both the relationship with God and what he does for us, as well as, you know, some of the things that we learn through mental health techniques and coping strategies and, you know, um, emotional regulation and things of that nature. Um, and they can kind of marry one another together. Have you ever wondered whether the Bible was compatible with the near-death experience? In my book, Heaven's Truth, the parallels between the Bible and the near-death experience, your faith will be strengthened while you support this channel. In Heaven's Truth, you will learn about near-death experiences and other similar experiences in the Bible. Support for the Bible contained in NDEs. A central theme that runs through both the Bible and NDEs. How the NDE brings the Bible to life for these modern times. Evidence for both the Bible and the NDE. And much more. Great book. Spillers does an excellent job weaving the relationship between NDEs and the scriptures. Five stars on Amazon. Available on Amazon. Yeah, I don't know how it is now, but like um, a few decades ago, I remember there was kind of a lot of hostility between people in the Christian community and faith community and counseling. And I never really saw such a big deal because when you look at like traditional medicine, most most Christians and people of faith don't have a problem going to a doctor, but then yet also praying for it and looking at alternative medicine, things like that, and blending it all together. So I don't understand yeah. why there was such a push between me traditional mental health therapy and faith that they couldn't work together. Do you still see any pushback? Yeah. I see a huge pushback still. I mean, it's gotten a lot better in the church, but that's one of the reasons I have such a passion for it is, is I really love to go speak at churches and help educate churches to understand that it isn't bad to get therapy. And for some reason, a lot of churches still think that we don't need therapy or we don't need mental health services. And it's just not true. It's just not accurate because although we do need you know, we do need prayer and we do need God more than anything. Um, it's okay to incorporate therapy as well. They don't have to be at war with one another. They can, they can work together. We just have to always line everything up with the authority of scripture. Um, and it's because a lot of times uh, pastors or, or, you know, teacher people in the church will believe that all we have to do is pray everything away. And I believe that it's okay to kind of mix those things in together as long as everything is, is lined up with the word of God. Um, and it's just that sometimes people think that like, oh, we just, we have to just pray things away and we can't go and just talk to someone. Um, but I think it's okay to just go and talk to someone, you know, I mean, that, that, that's okay. Um, you know, and, and so I, I try to really educate churches to say, you know, this is how we can deal with grief, right? Like, this is how you, this is how you deal with, um, you know, someone who is grieving. This is how you can properly deal with and, and help with, help someone who has a mental health diagnosis. This is how you deal with, help with someone who has depression, um, and really helping to kind of break that stigma that has been there, um, and really help to, to connect to those two groups of people. Well, and it seems like there's a lot more discussion just in general about the importance of mental health. And probably a lot of that is because of what happened with COVID the past couple of years, people being shut in and being isolated from each other. But now they're starting to realize, oh, there's, yes. there's more of a crisis in mental health than there had been maybe a few years ago even. Absolutely. The suicide rate is, is high. The divorce rate is high. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely devastating. So in terms of your therapy and working with scripture, do you tend to look towards um, drugs or medicines to help people? Or do you just work more with um, counseling type therapy? So I'm not a doctor, so I can't prescribe anything to anyone. Um, I do believe that, that there is a place and time where medication can be important for people. Um, I, I myself have been on medication before for, for things that I've needed um, to be on medicine for. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. 
Um, I think that sometimes, you know, studies show that that the, the best case scenario for some people is, is talk therapy as well as uh, medication. And so I think that, um, that that can be really beneficial for people. I don't think that we have to go right to that all the time. I think that um, sometimes people are over-medicated, but I think that um, we, we should be open to that as an option if we need it as Christians, you know, that uh, there are times that we need that and that there should not be a negative stigma to that. Just like if a diabetic needs insulin, there shouldn't be a negative stigma, stigma to that. Um, it doesn't mean that you, if you need it for a period of time that you're going to need it forever. It's okay to need depression medication or anxiety medication, and it's okay to pray and ask the Lord to, to um, you know, to, to not need it forever. You know, I believe that as well, um, you know, to, to ask the Lord to help you to get off of that. Um, I'm not one of those people that, that feels like you have to be on it forever either. Um, I was on medication for PTSD after being in a incredibly abusive relationship you know, where I experienced um, some really bad abuse and I needed PTSD medication coming off of that. And I, and I needed anxiety medication and depression medication, and I didn't want to be on that for a long time. So I, I didn't um, have a problem being on it. I knew I needed it. I knew that I, I was on um, anxiety and depression medicine for a long time. And I asked the Lord, I said, God, I don't want to be on this forever. And so I slowly was able to get off of it. And I, and I thank God for that. Um, so I'm kind of a believer in both where it's like, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be on it forever. I don't want to be the person who's on it forever. It's fine if, if somebody wants to be. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that there's anything wrong with admitting that that's something that you need. What does soul care mean? Because you talk about soul care. Yeah, it's a great question. So for me, the reason I call myself a soul care coach is because we have so many people who say, you know, take care of your body, you know, take care of, of your mind, um, you know, take care of your relationships. You have all these things, but very rarely do you hear people say, take, take care of your soul. And so for me, I really, I talk so much about taking care of just your relationship with God and who you are um, as, as um, just your, your personhood with the Lord. And, and so I always say, like, are you taking care of your relationship with God? and really pouring into that relationship with, with, with God. Um, and so for me, that also includes like all of you, you know? And so I, um, I, I help people to kind of, um, level up in their relationship with the Lord. And so, um, a soul care coach is really just taking care of their soul, which includes, um, just them, them as a whole. So, you know, are you taking care of yourself? And so it really is looking at, um, let's look at er every area of your of yourself. You know, are you are you where you want to be in your relationship with the Lord? Are you where you want to be in who you are? What is your purpose? You know, what really sets your soul on fire? What gets you excited to wake up in the morning? Um, and and are you in that place in your life? And if you're not, let's talk. Let's get you to where you you feel like you are excited to live your life and you feel like you are living your life on purpose and for a purpose. And that's what I'm passionate about is really helping people to feel like they are living a purposeful life that they don't have to take a vacation from. And it's not about money or feeling like they are, they've arrived in some place, but feeling like they are connected with the purpose that God has given them to, to live. And practically, <clears throat> what kind of things do you do you recommend to help people to get connected? Is it sort of having like a regular time of um, praying in the morning, praying in the evening, um, doing other things? <clears throat> yeah, great question. So absolutely. Like, first of all, it has to be, there has to be um, steps that you take every single day. So there has to be things that are staples in your schedule that are non-negotiable. So I always say, make sure that you have a time in your day that you spend with the Lord no matter what. So for me, it's early in the morning. The Bible talks about, you know, meeting him early in the morning. And so for me, it's that that's non-negotiable. I meet with him early in the morning every day. Um, if morning time is not for you and you're just not a morning person, you can't function that, that's fine. Um, you know, set a time in the day where it's, it's quiet time with you and the Lord. Um, so, you know, if, if you're not somebody who has that discipline yet, that's okay. Start small. Don't try to start off with an hour a day. Start with five minutes, um, you know, and just get before the Lord and, and just be quiet, you know, spend five minutes in quiet time or um, read, uh, you know, get a, get your app on your phone 
and do a, a Bible a Bible app and read a scripture. Um, you know, start a, uh, a gratitude journal. And, you know, that is a great discipline to have. A gratitude journal is where you're just three things a day that you're thankful for. You know, God, today I'm thankful that, um, you know, I'm thankful that you gave me life. I'm thankful that you gave me my child. And I'm thankful that you gave me, you know, uh, this water bottle, right? Like I'm thankful for clean water. And so just that kind of thing where you can set, you know, this time that you do these things every single day and set those small things that are non-negotiable in your calendar every day. And it's the time that you're spending with the Lord. Also be cognizant of what you're putting in your mind. So anything that you are, are, are spending energy and time in is going to grow. So if you are spending time and energy on Netflix in the evening, five hours a night, if you get off work at five and until 10 every night, you are binge watching Netflix, that, that numbing yourself out is what you're like, your, your brain is, is not going to grow right? Your spirit is what needs to be growing. So instead of those five hours a night, maybe take 30 minutes of that and start, you know, start small, 20 minutes of that and, and put on a sermon or put on a podcast or put on something that is going to, you know, put on praise and worship music and put on something in your, in your um, home that's going to uplift your spirit and just kind of start to put something in your home that's going to set the atmosphere that's going to actually feed your mind instead of numbing you out or bringing you down. So just start in those small little things and, and, and you'll be surprised by how much it may, how much it changes. And then the third thing is what do you have around you? So if you could look and see like around me, I'm in this little alcove of my, of my um, desk area and I have, I'm surrounded by um, pictures of things that I have put up that I want to, that inspire me of where, you know, of things that I want to be. Uh, like pictures and places I want to travel to, as well as Bible verses and affirmations that I say every day. So those are things that I say to myself every single day, Bible verses, pictures of places I want to go to remind myself to dream, to remind myself to, um, to not be complacent of where I want to be. So yes, like, you know, I'm happy and I'm thankful of where I want to be, but I'm also reminded of the person that I want to be so that I can show up as that person today. So if I want to be fit, I'm showing up as the fit person that I want to be today because otherwise I'm just going to show up as, you know, the slobby person that I'm, that I'm feeling like today. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are some things that you can do tangibly today. And like one thing I tend to do is I, when I wake up in the morning, I do, prayer and affirmations. When I go to bed at night, I do prayer and affirmations. So I get that in. And something you can do for like scripture is um, on YouTube, they have several versions of the whole Bible you can listen to. And you can listen to the Bible mm -hmm. being read. <clears throat> yes. So, And that's free on YouTube. So, yeah. I actually just had a friend tell me that last night. He said, uh, you should listen to the Bible as you sleep. So they just get that in your, as you, as you get that in your head, as you sleep, just having it in the background. I listen to sermons as I get ready in the morning. I listen to a sermon every morning as I get ready. Um, and I just have that going in the background. And then usually I have on Audible, some kind of Christian, you know, book that I'm listening to as I do the dishes. I do that. Um, just so that I'm feeding my mind, because usually I'll, you know, I used to have the TV going, but what's the point? Like, I'd rather have some kind of Christian book going, you know, that I can be feeding my mind or a sermon or something like that, um, that, that I can be going as I do those things. So I very rarely even turn the TV on anymore because I'm constantly, excuse me, I'm constantly feeding my mind. And it just, the more that I do that, the more I'm like, wow, I learned this and, and I love it. And it's just, it's, it's life-changing. Yeah, and I know like with gratitude, a lot of people are starting to pick up on the importance of gratitude. There's actually scientific studies that show that if you're more grateful, you can reduce stress and anxiety with things like oh, gratitude. Yes. I actually did a challenge. Um, uh, it was actually a couple of years ago. I did a challenge where I said, I'm not going to complain for 30 days. 
And I thought that that wouldn't be hard because I'm not usually a complainer, but it was actually the hardest, one of the hardest things I've done in a long time. And so what I said was, I'm not going to complain about anything, not even a small complaint. And anytime I complain, I'm going to make myself find 10 things that I'm thankful for. So any small complaint I would say, I had to replace it with 10, 10 things. And it would just even be a small thing. Like I'd come up on a red light and I'd be like, oh, this is annoying. And then I would have to say 10 things that I was thankful for in that moment. And I realized it made me really realize how much you complain in a day. And it really made me turn that around, that whole thing around. And, um, and it, it really does do wonders for you and you can be grateful. Yeah, and it, it can bring you down mentally when you're complaining a lot, which can then affect your physical body. But there's probably a spiritual component to it as well that it can bring your spirit down as well. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And the Bible says to take every thought captive. So if there's something that is, you know, coming into your mind that is not aligning with, with what the word says to do, you've got to take it, thought, like taking it captive is a very, um, you know, intentional thing. You have to take it captive and throw it away and be like, no, this is not something that I am going to have in my mind. And I'm going to intentionally replace it with something that is what God tells me to have in my mind. Mm-hmm. How important is self-esteem for people? You know, it is very important to believe in ourselves as far as to believe in what God says we are, right? So self-esteem is a hard word to say when we are Christians, because honestly, um, I don't have belief in myself as much as I have belief in God. Um, I don't believe that, like, I'm not supposed to boast in who I am, right? Um, because I boast in Christ. So I don't believe in self-esteem the way the world believes in self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I believe in, I believe in who God created me to be. Right. Um, so it's kind of hard, uh, being, this is where being in psychology is hard as a Christian, because I could go, you know, and really argue this in the psychology field, because people will argue me this all day long, where they say believing in yourself is so important. I believe that believing in who God says I am is important. And so um, it's really important to believe that, that uh, we are just as important as anyone else in this world, right? You are just as important as anyone else God created. You're not any more important. You're not any less important than anyone else God created. Um, and you are made in the image of God. And that is incredibly important to understand. And once you recognize who you are in Christ, the possibilities are endless. However, it's also important to remember that we boast in nothing but Christ, right? And so that's kind of where that line is, is to remember that um, everything we have and everything that we are is in him. So that is, that's kind of the, the line we have to walk in Christ. Well, and it's, it seems like just in general that maybe the world is starting to realize that you can overdo it with self-esteem in a sense like, you know, when parents are constantly just telling their kids, oh, you're the best, you're the best, it kind of rolls off them and says, oh, sure, whatever, you know, that you want to encourage your kids, but you don't want to be, you know, overdoing it to where it becomes kind of phony. Right. And you don't want to believe so much in yourself that you think that you can do anything and that it's all about you, you know? Like all these people say, I'm self-made, I'm self-made. I'll be the first one to say that nothing about every, nothing about the good things that I have are from me. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Lord, the Bible says. So any good thing that I have is from God, you know? And, and I will not ever take, I will never take credit for that. And so that's one thing that, and every good, Every good thing about me is, is him anyways, because I'm made in his image. And so, you know, but it's also important to remember that, you know, we don't want to have a low view of ourselves either because we're created in his image, you know? So it's, it's really important to kind of find that fine line and uh, make sure that we, we walk humbly in that. Is, and what is self-care about? Is that similar to soul care? Self-care is really about like taking care of ourselves and making sure that we prioritize ourselves and make sure that we, we take care of ourselves. So um, a lot of times people will, 
they'll take care of other people first. So especially like, you know, empathic people, people who want to care for others, parents a lot of times do this where, you know, we're, we're caring for others and we, especially those of us in ministry and things like that, um, you know, we want to love and care for other people so much that we don't, um, we don't always take care of ourselves. And so self-care is really about like saying things like, I'm going to say no to something so that I can say yes to something else. Self-care is boundaries. You know, I'm going to say no to what I need to say no to. Um, Self-care is I'm going to make sure that I'm in bed by 10 o'clock so that I can get up at six and have a good night's sleep. Um, Self-care is, you know, making sure you eat the right food and drink enough water and, um, you know, those types of things, right? So, you know, just self-care is really making sure that you are um, filling your cup so that you can then pour out to other people. Um, Because a lot of times we just run on empty and then we expect ourselves to perform as if we are at full capacity. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like Tony Robbins would sometimes talk about if the plane's going down and the oxygen mask comes down, they always tell, tell you to put it on yourself first you know, and so then you can help other people. But the natural tendency is I got to help other people do it first. But you have to be able to take care of yourself in order to take care of others. And when you're operating at a higher level yourself, then you're able to help more people. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Whenever you help yourself first, then you're able to be able to, to give yourself, give of yourself in a better way. I always tell, you know, my clients, like when you take care of yourself, you're the best mom or the best dad or the best sister or brother or wife or whatever that you can be, because you can't be the best version of yourself if you're not caring for yourself. And that is hard to wrap your mind around sometimes because it feels selfish, but it is actually selfish to not take care of yourself more than anything else. What is religious abuse? Because I know you had uh, mentioned that's a really good question yeah yeah so religious abuse is honestly um something that i came around to a few years ago and um that is is when somebody uses the bible or uses christianity or any religion honestly to abuse another person um which is like twisting the word of god or twisting their religion to whatever narrative they have for you um so using the word of god to um, to fit whatever they think that it should in order to hurt you, right? So, um, maybe seeing it through their lens and calling you names and saying whatever they think that, that they see it as, right? Um, and, and, um, using it to, to hold you down, right? So, Mm -hmm. um, maybe they meet somebody who, who has a a past that they want to hold against you. And so they are abusing you, by using the word of God, um, but out of context, right? So maybe they meet somebody who has a past that, that they're saying like, oh, well, look at, look at what the Bible says about your past. So I'm going to hold it against you. When really, if you read the whole Bible, the Bible says that you're forgiven, but they're going to pinpoint the, the Bible verses that they're going to manipulate and make it look like, you know, you're a, that you're not forgiven, you know, so they're actually manipulating the word of God and using it to abuse you, you know, or using it to, um, you know, to make you a servant to them or using it to do whatever narrative they think. Just like there are people out there who think that the Bible um, makes it okay for them to have slaves or makes it okay for them to, um, you know, whatever narr- stupid narrative that they have, you know, racism or um, sexism or whatever. And so it's like this, this abuse that they have. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's just, it's the craziest thing. Um, but it tends to be birthed out of this religious belief of, of abuse. Um, and so then also I saw, I've seen several times in religious abuse where, um, you know, I've had clients before where they have, um, where they have punished, inside of religion, like, um, I've had clients before where they've actually, um, punished their children 
by telling them, okay, you're going to go to hell, um, you know, because you did this sin and there's no way now to go back from it. You know, that to me is religious abuse. That's not what got you. Like, you're not God. You don't get to tell your kid that, that they're going to hell. You know, I've had, I've had that happen multiple times where I've had to come in and, and, um, you know, do therapy with kids because the parents have said, well, it's too late for you now, you know, two little, little children. It's too late for you now. God's sending you to hell. Um, I consider that religious abuse, you know, mm -hmm. um, those types of things. So, um, I mean, it, there's just a whole gamut of things when it comes to religious abuse, but anything that is that where the word of God or any other religion, honestly, is twisted to fit a narrative of a person, I, I consider that religious abuse. Well, and the thing is, is there are controlling people that can see religion as a powerful force in people's life, and then they can use that and twist it to do their own agenda. And you know, it can go to extremes right. like Jim Jones or something like that. Um, and I think yeah. sometimes people will see that and they'll say, well, all religion is bad then because there are people that control and manipulate it and use it for those kind of purposes. But it, it's like anything else. It could, it's a powerful tool for people, but it can be used for other things too. Like when you think about things like the fruits of the Holy Spirit, if you're magnifying those things it could be the most beautiful thing right. there but it could also be twisted and right. manipulated to become something that's horrendous yep absolutely and that's really what it's about and that's why the bible says that we we look at somebody's fruit because a good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit but yeah everything can be twisted and manipulated So do you deal a lot with um, issues like um, divorce too and, and uh, relationships? Absolutely. Yeah, I do marriage therapy. Um, I, I don't prefer it. It's not my favorite. I don't love uh, marriage therapy. Um, I do marriage or I do marriage uh, coaching now, like relationship coaching. I do that. Um, but I would say marriage therapy isn't my favorite, but it is something that I that I do. Yes. What are the kind of things you, you tend to tell people to help them improve their marriage or to not get a divorce? Is there certain keys that they can do? Yeah, so it's really just about communication the most. It's about communicating expectations and really having realistic expectations. Um, I would say probably 90% of breakdowns and dissolutions of relationships come down to un uncommunicated expectations. Um, and unrealistic expectations. So I would say come up with what your expectation is and communicate it with one another, you know, and then also have like ask each other questions. We really forget to ask questions of one another and making sure that we ask ourselves questions and ask each other questions. Because a lot of times we don't ask questions of like just basic questions of am I loving you well, you know, am I loving you well? Um, do you feel loved? How can I love you better? Um, just those types of questions, check-in questions. Am I hearing you right? You know, is this really what you said? Um, those types of things can go a really long way. Um, and then how am I feeling? So just basic check-in questions with yourself. Sometimes we forget to do those things with ourselves. So if we don't know how we're feeling, how are we supposed to expect our spouse to know how we feel or how, how we're feeling? Um, so how am I feeling? What do I need? And what am I avoiding? Those are three really great questions to ask ourselves um, so that we can then communicate that with our spouse as well. Um, so those are really good things. And then also have a check-in time with your spouse every week. So the same time every single week, um, I usually suggest at the beginning of the week. So like on a Sunday um, where you can check in with each other and just say like, what's the upcoming week going to look like? Um, what do we need from each other? And then how did we do this previous week so that we can, can um, improve this next week of what the next week's going to look like. Are things like, have you heard of a book called The Five Love Languages? I think it's Gary Chapman. Of course. Are those kind of things helpful mm -hmm. too, to know your, your spouse's Absolutely. love language? Absolutely, yeah. To learn one another's love languages, to learn how you speak love, how you receive love. Absolutely, yeah. If you can figure out how to 
um, speak each other's love languages. I mean, that's absolutely um, invaluable, completely. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like one thing that's always important too is just to remain calm and to know like if your spouse is upset with you, chances are they probably won't be upset with you an hour from now on that or whatever, that it will pass. And when you can realize that, then it's like you could right. remain calm and not overreact and just escalate things. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is remembering too, that like most of the time, whatever the issue is, isn't really the issue. Usually there's something else there too, you know, and that's mm -hmm. why asking questions is important. And also that's why it's also important to communicate how you really feel. Like, is this really how I'm feeling? And also communicating in the moment as much as possible um, and communicating how you're feeling when you're feeling it. And then, um, you know, asking each other those questions and then making sure that you are um, being true to each other uh, and, and really making sure that you're being true to your, to your emotions. Because a lot of times we try to keep the peace and that's really not helpful. Like we want to keep the peace. And of course that means like, we don't want to go around just picking fights every time we get irritated because that's not helpful. But we also don't want to ignore things for 15 different times we get irritated and then blow up about something stupid. So for example, we don't want to, you know, just ignore, okay, we get irritated at, you know, you do this, I ignore it. You do this, I ignore it. You do this, I ignore it. And then you, you know, leave out the peanut butter. And then I blow up at you because you leave out the peanut butter. And then you're like, why are you mad at me? I just left out the peanut butter. It's not a big deal. And you think it's about the peanut butter, but really it's about the other 15 things that just happened. I really should have told you about the other 15 things that happened because now you're really lost and confused about the peanut butter. And you think that I have an anger problem. And want to send me to an anger management control thing because I blow up about peanut butter, right? And mm -hmm. so like, it's really, I owed you, like I owe you to be authentic about the other things that have happened so we can communicate that about them. And so be authentic about how they, how you feel in the moment. And then you won't have to have this blow up. So if I would have in the moment been like, Hey babe, I just want to let you know, like, I feel like I feel this way when you do this in the moment, you know, we could have nipped it in the bud and been done with it. And then when you left out the peanut butter, you'd have been, I could have been like, Hey, you know, I really feel irritated when this happens because then I have to like go back and clean up after you. And it probably wouldn't have been as a uh, 10 escalation to me because we would have dealt with the other 15 things that wouldn't have been a big deal hmm. so are there any um books or projects you're working on and how can people reach you if they want to get in contact with you yeah so currently i'm actually working on two different books but i have not put either of them out yet um so i'm working on a book about shame right now it's called um out of the pig pen my journey out of shame so it'll hopefully be out in the in the next two months or three months um, and then I'm working on a Christian um, girls uh, uh, journal that will be for teen girls. Uh, I don't know when that'll be, be out yet. But if anybody wants to get in touch with me, actually, for anybody who is listening to this podcast, they can go to my uh, website, which is sheervisioncoaching.com. So that's S-H-E-A-R visioncoaching.com. And they can go to the contact me section. And um, they, if they put that they found me on this, on this podcast, I'll give them a free 20-minute um, consultation with me if they just tell me they found me through here um, and see if they're a good fit with me for coaching. And um, I would love to connect with you. Also, you can find me on social media, on Instagram, Sheer Vision Coaching, or on Facebook, um, Becca George, B-E-K-A-H, George. I'd love to connect. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And thanks for the gift that you're giving the audience too. I appreciate that. Of course. Thank you for having me. I love it.